I'm Grady, and this is my column on computing, Remembrance of Things Past. I've had the pleasure of visiting Bletchley Park several times as part of the research for my documentary project, Computing the Human Experience. A 45-minute Midland train ride departing from London's Euston Station takes you to the area. Then, a short walk from Bletchley Park Station leads you to an unassuming entrance where once passed Alan Turing, Tommy Flowers, and the thousands of men and women who labored in secrecy. Collectively, they changed the outcome of World War II. Individually, the contributions of a few laid the foundations of modern computing. Until recently, a strong possibility existed that Bletchley Park would be lost to modern development, thanks to the efforts started by Tony Sale and then made manifest by a remarkable woman, Sue Black as detailed in her book, Saving Bletchley Park. It has been saved for future generations who owe so much to the work that took place there. I first met Tony on my visit to Bletchley. He was one of the first members of Computing's Board of Advisors. I've also come to know Sue as well, first meeting her in 2012 when she introduced me for my BCS Lovelace Lecture Award. Tony has since passed away. Among other things, he's known for building a, an operational reconstruction of the Colossus computer that was used to break the Lorenz cipher. The imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch was a wonderful story filled with excellent acting, but it contained some profoundly warped history. Aaron Sorkin's movie Steve Jobs can be similarly described. Well, the historical truth of Sorkin's version was warped by an even stronger reality distortion field. But I'll leave that discussion for another day. Although the movie rightfully portrayed Turing as the hurry hero of Bletchley, it required engineers such as Tommy Flowers to make Turing's ideas come to life in relays and in tubes. It also took the efforts of almost 10,000 men and women, mostly women actually. These workers tediously compiled message indices, computed decryptions by hand, and generally attended to the myriad administrative details of handling the considerable radio traffic that flowed into Bletchley, as well as the critical intelligence information that flowed out. To preserve Bletchley Park's secrets, <clears throat> Churchill had all the computers and records therein destroyed after the war. Only eight photographs of Colossus survived, along with a few partial schematics. Building off of this scant evidence, Tony worked with Arnold Lynch, who had worked with Flowers and had himself designed Colossus's optical reader to rebuild the machine. On one visit to Bletchley, I noticed a bin filled with vacuum tubes. Innocent geek that I am, I asked, what are these? Tony replied, oh, those are burnt out valves used by the original Colossus and left over from the war. Cheeky geek that I am, I then asked, could I have some? <clears throat> After a bit of formal back and forth, the good folks at Bletchley shipped me a handful. I kept one and gave all the others to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. The lesson here is that you rarely get that for which you don't ask. That valve, <clears throat> sorry, I mean vacuum tube for those of you not from the UK, now sits in a prominent spot in my office, along another bit of ephemera precious to me, a nanosecond that Admiral Grace Hopper gave me. Grace was a remarkable woman. During World War II, she worked alongside Howard Aiken, on the Mark I. Later on, she was part of the team that developed UNIVAC at the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation, and while there, developed the first compiler. She was also instrumental in creating COBOL. Besides her many technical contributions, Grace was an incredible storyteller. As digital computers became faster, capable of many more operations per second than the early electromechanical computers on which she had worked. She struggled to find a metaphor to explain those advances to the layperson. As she often said, I didn't know what a billion was. I don't think most of those men downtown in Congress know what a billion is either. And if you don't know what a billion is, how on earth do you know what a billionth is? Grace directed her engineers to take telephone wire and cut it down to 11.8 inches, 30 centimeters, for those of you in the more civilized parts of the world. She gave these as, away as part of her lectures. Take a nanosecond, she would say, explaining that this particular length of wire represented the distance that light traveled in a vacuum in one nanosecond. 
I still have the nanosecond that Grace handed me while visiting the Air Force Academy where I was a cadet back in 1976. In my research, I stumbled upon a comment by someone calling himself Tomorrowful. He powerfully summarized Grace's impact on computing by saying, Grace was created by a wise and subtle god as the ultimate weapon to be deployed against idiotic statements that women aren't suited to work in software development. It is therefore fitting and proper that the Anita Borg Institute created a conference named the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. Started in 1994, the Grace Hopper Conference has grown to be the premier conference in this space, this year attracting a record 12,000 women. I was one of three men asked to speak at this year's conference. The experience was incredibly humbling and powerful. Here I was, a distinct minority, in the midst of thousands of women whose average age was about a third of mine, each filled with a passion and a hope for doing things that mattered. I spoke on the history and the future of software development. One thing that always surprises me in these settings is just how little most people in our profession know about its history. Did you already know the second of story of Grace and her nanoseconds? How about the history of some of the first computers at Harvard in 1890? And by computers, I mean women who compute, referring to a small band of women who perform calculations for astronomical tables for male astronomers. Let's also not forget some of the first Agile programmers, the women who programmed ENIAC. I say Agile because they were given algorithms to carry out, and in very much an incremental and iterative fashion, and without much external direction at all, they devised the proper way to program ENIAC's plug boards. Then there's Margaret Hamilton, who strong evidence suggests coined the term software engineering. Some claim that it was the NATO conference by that same name in 1968, but I'm placing my bets on Margaret. Susan Roger, Katie Dickerson, and Jessica Goodman have cataloged many other notable women in computing, and I urge you to learn more about those who have made important contributions to the field. I have two other artifacts in my office worth mentioning. The first is a replica of the, one of the first practical mechanical clocks made in 1335. The second is a board from Deep Blue, the IBM computer that beat chess grandmaster Garry Kasparov. What do the clock, the vacuum tube, wire, and board have in common? I keep them nearby as a remembrance of things past and a hope for an even more enchanted world of the future. The clock ticks away softly in the background of an electronic hub that, hum that fills my office. The vacuum tube reminds me that the fundamental roots of computing still pervade all we do. Computation is, after all, universal. The wire reminds me to never forget just how powerful our machines have become. The board reminds me that all we do in computing has an impact, sometimes intentional, most often unexpected, on the human experience. Life was simple before World War II, Gray said. After that, we had systems. Well, I'd offer that life before World War II probably had its own kind of complexity, but it's certainly true that we now live in a world of both unprecedented complexity and astonishing possibility. We should never forget our past, for those who came before us in computing enabled these possibilities. Yeah.